Stephanie Quine with the weekly Law Report, coming to you this week from the Law Courts in Sydney. It's been a busy time here with the latest James Hardy decision handed down last week and the reshuffle of senior judges and justices. But first, did the closing decision in the long-running James Hardy saga achieve justice for the victims of asbestos? The New South Wales Court of Appeal slapped each of the seven former non-executive directors involved with a $25,000 fine and disqualified them from serving on boards for two years. Asbestos victims and their families have questioned whether anyone has truly been held to account when no one has been sent to jail for their actions. I spoke with Professor Michael Adams, who said that this case, while emotionally charged, is ultimately about director duties. One of the aspects of the James Hardy litigation has been, of course, that it doesn't really help the victims of the asbestos. Um, this case is not really about compensation. It's certainly not about paying a penalty in the terms of sending somebody to jail. This case is about director's duties. However, I think it's received a lot of media attention because of the James Hardy product, the fact of the, the dangers of asbestos, and the fact this company was around for 100 years, and from the mid-70s knew that it was a deadly disease, or it could cause a deadly disease, and knew, in fact, until uh, it wasn't stopped until 1987 but the product still causes people to die even today and will continue to do so. And of course it's employees, it is um, people who work in building science, even the latest examples of the um, meter boards for electricity companies and people drilling it and then inhaling the asbestos dust. So it's an ongoing liability. And of course it's not just in Australia, it is around the world. James Hardy represents 50% of all dust disease cases in Australia. So it is a, has a huge responsibility here. The case itself originally was to be a criminal case. The DPP examined the evidence to work out whether a criminal action could be brought. My understanding is there was not enough evidence for the criminal case to proceed, and so the focus was on the corporate regulator to bring the civil penalty provisions. The criminal provisions in the director's duties, predominantly section 184, only relate to where there is an intentional wrong. So if you intended to lie, or you're so uh, wrongfully, willfully ignoring the possibilities of telling the truth, then those sort of false statements could have a grounds. Here, there, I don't think there's any suggestion that the directors were deliberately lying, deliberately misleading. They failed to take the reasonable care expected of a board at that standard. That is a public listed company. And that's quite a big difference. But I think it is a very emotionally charged subject matter because these directors did receive very high salaries. They received high director's fees. And it appears that they weren't really looking after the funds of the, for the asbestos victims. The difference between $245 million in assets and $1.5 billion is obviously a huge gap. I think the court was signalling that that was an error way beyond what is reasonable. Theodora Ahilis has worked closely with victims of asbestos. I spoke to her about what she thinks of the latest Hardy ruling. I think having um, decreased the penalties is not a good thing for the public because the perception is that people are allowed to get away with it. But when you look at what we're talking about here, the corporate governance, it, is, it, it sends a message. It sends a message that <clears throat> if you sit on a board, if you have directors, if you're a director, um, you have duties, you have obligations to do the right thing within the corporate space. You have obligations to read your notes, to read the board minutes, to vote appropriately and to make a decision, not a consensus decision, but to make a decision that you're comfortable with when you make these decisions with all the information provided to you properly. The other, the issue that arises from all of this, and it's what's gotten victims up in arms or victims groups and, and, and the public, is this issue of morality, corporate morality. Do we have an obligation as, as citizens who sit in a corporate space or wear the shoes in a corporate space to have a social morality about issues? And I think we do. They're very different, and you have to bring that morality with you in every space that you're, you're, you work with. But, uh, I, don't th I don't think we've seen the end of all of this. I think um, people are going to take it a lot more seriously when they take on that role. 
The other thing we need to understand, we're not talking about a criminal um, issue here, we're talking about civil obligations. They're quite different in law and I wasn't surprised by what happened. But I can understand why the public, as a public person, they'd be outcry about it. You've obviously worked very closely with victims of asbestos related diseases and their families. Why is financial compensation so important for them? When a person receives a terminal prognosis and it involves a compensation element, is that it becomes absolutely crucial to that person, that victim, that they obtain an outcome for their family. <coughs> Every person I see, and I deal exclusively with asbestos victims and their families, I deal exclusively with asbestos, uh, with dust diseases, and every person I see, the first thing they say to me is, I want my family to be looked after. I want to ensure that I do what I can to make sure that my family is looked after. People could be diagnosed and, day, and die within days of diagnosis, and I've seen that happen. Some people live for five, and I've had um, a client live for 10 years with the diagnosis of mesothelioma. But because it's such an unpredictable prognosis and an unpredictable disease, it's important to act immediately once you're diagnosed because if you don't start a claim in that person's lifetime, the victim's lifetime, the general damages die with the victim. So it's very hard to resurrect a claim or a majority of the claim post-death. So it's, it's also very important if someone commences a claim in their lifetime that it's finished in their lifetime so they can see the result of that and do what they want with the f funds they get from their, their claim so they can put their family affairs in order. People have come to me with bucket lists of things they want to do and say, you know, I always wanted to go to Alaska. Can we make this happen? And it's very important to make sure that when people do have that wish and desire that you try and facilitate that process. In other news, Australia's 50th High Court judge was announced on Tuesday. Federal Court Chief Justice Patrick Keane will replace Justice Dyson Hayden, who leaves the bench in March next year when he turns 70, the compulsory retirement age for High Court judges. President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, Justice James Alsop, was named Keane's successor. He will be the fourth Chief Justice appointed to the Federal Court since its inception in 1977. Well, those are our top stories from the law courts here in Sydney this week. I hope you enjoyed this special edition of the Weekly Law Report. Don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and join in discussions on LinkedIn. I'm Stephanie Quine. Thanks for watching.